So, Amber here with Tiago National Title. Um, I wanted to give everybody an opportunity um, to jump on um, and then, of course, ask me uh, questions if they had any. Let me lock my computer. Um, but if anybody has any questions in regards to title, anything, if it's a contract question, if it's what is an estoppel, is it if it's what is uh, title insurance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Any questions you guys have, I did print out um, the 27 most common questions that people ask title um, companies about, just in case um, nobody has anything that they've got that they wanted answered. It's kind of like a free for all. Um, I do a lot of Facebook Lives now, um, especially during all this crazy time with COVID-19 and, and all the crazy changes that we've got going on in our industry. Um, so if you haven't seen those, then you know you can go to our Tiago Title uh, St. Pete page um, and see all of those or even the Seminole page. Also, it's all shared on my page as well, but I share a lot of stuff, so you're gonna have to scroll. But um, we've already gone over what is title insurance. Um, I've, I've done a couple of Facebook Lives about that. So I didn't want to dig too much into that because it's 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 pretty redundant. It's pretty much the same. Um, uh, there are a lot of people that don't know who chooses title. Um, so I'm going to start off with that just because I think that's a great question. And um, I've got some fabulous ideas for buyers out there, especially investors that might not know how to negotiate um, being able to pick the title company. Um, so I wanted to kind of go over that and get rid of this pillow that's in my back. Um, so yeah, so the first question that I found um, online by just doing this awesome search that kind of tells me what are people Googling right now as far as questions for title companies. Um, the first one that is the most common um, is obviously what is title insurance, not a lot of people know that, but if you're a realtor out there, a lender out there, a title company out there and you're watching this, you probably already know the answer to that. Most um, investors already know the answer to that, so title insurance just basically covers the transaction. Um, and the policy is actually what protects the lender and the buyer um, against any potential loss that was derived from you know problems that were related to the actual transaction in the title. Um, who chooses title? Uh, that's the biggest question. A lot of people don't understand from a selling standpoint who chooses title, and even buyers don't really understand um, who chooses title. So the biggest thing, whoever picks the title company chooses Choose a title, right? <laughs> like usually um, in the contract. Hi, Amanda. Uh, usually in the contract, um, it, there's two sections um, on page. I believe it's page three of the um, Farbar contract. Uh, you've got the seller picks and the seller pays. And whenever the seller picks the title company, it's usually their agent that decides that because the agents are the one that deals with the most title companies um, and mostly every listing agent has a set title company that they prefer to use so they will suggest that title company to the seller and if the seller doesn't have um, a title company that they've worked with previously or didn't like the title company that they used when they purchased then of course they would have you know the option to choose that or they can go with the suggested uh, title company that their agent gave them However, a lot of investors, wholesalers, um, in general, always direct the business to the title company um, because they get really great pricing from their set title company, and then that would be the option to select off on buyer picks, buyer pays. In that situation, uh, pursuant to the Farbar contract, um, there's a section at the very top of, of that page three of that actual contract that actually states what the buyer pays if the buyer picks and then what the seller pays if the seller picks. The biggest kicker to that far bar contract, what a lot of people don't understand when they check off that the buyer's picking and paying, the seller thinks, oh, I don't have any closing costs I have to pay, when in fact, they do still have to pay the transfer tax for the deed. Um, so a lot of, hi <laughs> Trish, a lot of people don't understand that when the buyer picks and the buyer pays, if you don't write in there that the seller, uh, or that the buyer's paying the uh, transfer tax of the of the property, meaning the actual transfer tax from the deed, which is a substantial amount, and so usually if you take your purchase price, multiply it by .007, that's where we get the doc stamp amount, right? So if you're in the contract and you're a buyer and you check off, I'm paying, I'm picking title, I'm paying the owner's policy, um, and 
the seller gets the closing statement and is like, why are transfer taxes on my, on my side of the closing statement? It's because that FAR bar contract doesn't state that the buyer has to pay for the transfer taxes. All that portion is saying is that the buyer is responsible for um, the owner's policy and in any costs associated to that. So that's a big kicker to it. A lot of people, whenever we're doing a closing um, and the buyer has picked title and they have chosen to pay for the closing cost and they're using that standard FAR bar contract that was revised um, back in April of 2017, then the seller is still paying the doc stamps for the deed. So that's a big kicker. So if you are representing a seller and you get a contract offer back from an investor that is saying, I'm gonna pick title, I'm gonna pay all the closing costs on there, make sure that you are checking off or going into the section where it says seller co closing cost, uh, right above that line item, make sure that you're putting in there that the seller does not pay the transfer tax if you're the listing agent for the seller. That's the biggest thing. Um, a lot of investors have their own purchase addendums or purchase contracts that they actually use and it's clear as day that the buyer pays all closing costs. Um, and then of course they would pay the transfer tax for the deed, the doc stamps, they would pay for the owner's policy, they would pay the title search fee, they'd pay the closing fees for both the buyer and the seller. Um, we're actually one of the only title companies that doesn't double up on our closing costs like that. We kind of work with investors because we're super investor friendly. Um, we like to make it as, as, as cost worthy as possible for the investor so that it doesn't tap into their margin that they're working with. Um, so and that's the biggest thing. So if you're, like I said, if you're a listing agent out there and you've got a seller and you get an offer back from a buyer and they're an investor and they're like, we're going to pay all closing costs. We're going to choose the title company. It's totally fine. Just in order to protect your seller from paying any closing costs, you've got to make sure that you write in there that the buyer is to also pay the transfer tax. You do that in the additional terms and conditions section of your contracts. Um, that's where we see it the most, but that's the most important part. That way, when the seller goes to closing and they get their closing statement, and they're like, why in the world am I paying a transfer tax or doc stamps for a deed? I thought the buyer was paying all the closing costs. It's plain as day. Write your stuff in your contracts. Biggest thing ever. Um, if you are an investor and you're dealing with a seller directly and there's no agents, what we consider a FISBO, for sale by owner deal, um, and the, the, the seller's under the impression that you're paying all closing costs, do a courtesy to the seller and just clarify that in the contract so that way when they're signing their contract, they know for sure that the transfer taxes aren't going to be paid by them, that they're going to be paid by the buyer. Um, unless you know you want the seller to, and if that's a negotiation and discussion that you had directly with the seller, just make it plain as day in the contract because that helps us. Um, so yeah, who chooses title? Normally it's the seller, um, especially in a retail transaction, but in an investor transaction, wholesaler transaction, double close assignment transaction, it is generally directed by the buyer. Um, the buyer's out there, like I said, investors, all of that, wholesalers, the whole nine yards, they all have set title companies that they choose to work with. We do additional searches for them um, to protect their investments. Uh, a lot of the far bar contracts that are retail residential deals do not state that a permit and a code search needs to be done as part of a lien search. So that's an additional, you have to do it yourself, due diligence. Um, but if you work with a title company that you deal with all the time and they know how your deals work and they know that they need to protect you extra, we will do a permit and a code search for all of our investor deals that come in the door without even being asked. It's plain as day. Residential deals out there for anybody out there that's dealing with a retail transaction, buyer and seller, listing agent, buyer's agent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you as a buyer's agent or the buyer have got to ask the title company for a permit and a code search. The title companies are not just gonna go out and do them. We're not required to by the new contracts that were done back three years ago. Um, so that's a, an extra thing that I see a lot of buyer's agents will actually say, hey, can you guys please do a code and a permit search? And then of course we'll do that. If there's any additional cost to that code and permit search on the retail uh, far bar contract, in that type of a situation, then that additional cost will fall on the buyer. 
because it's an additional search. However, it is really, 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 really important to know when you're purchasing a property, especially right now in our market with all these contractors, roofers, and all these people out there that might not be licensed, they're not pulling permits, it's gonna stick you. Uh, permit departments are starting to come down a lot on properties just in general that had work done that permits weren't pulled. So if you do your own due diligence, you can search them online. Um, but I would always suggest to reach out, have your agent or you personally as a buyer, first time home buyer, whatever, reach out to that title company and say, hey, can you please do a permit and a code search for me? I just need to make sure that nothing's wrong with this property that's unrecorded. Um, so that's a little insight. Um, next question that I Googled um, for the top third question, I guess you can say, uh, is do I need title insurance? So a lot of people don't understand, like, do I need it? Is it something that I truly need? So here's a kicker. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run down as to, to the why, right? Because obviously title companies make their money out of the premiums that we're collecting for these title policies. Um, we make a 70% cut out of that amount and then 30% goes to our underwriter. Um, but still, do you need title insurance? Um, definitely, I would always say if you're a buyer purchasing a property, you want it, right? Whether you're a wholesaler, wholesalers don't really care. Investor, you definitely want title insurance. Um, from a first time home buyer to, you know, you've bought 1500 homes, this is your new primary home, whatever, definitely get title insurance. You always wanna get an owner's policy, right? Always. The reason for that actual owner's policy is because it's going to protect you, right? So if there's something that say, a title company missed and there's a lien out there that we completely missed and you have title insurance, that title insurance is gonna cover that lien up to the purchase price of what you purchased the property for, right? So it's basically like an additional coverage. It's not hazard insurance, it's not flood insurance, it's something different. It's to ensure the title in the transaction of what we did, right? Daniel made a great, great, great point, and I'm gonna to touch base on that, Daniel, in just a second, but a lot of people don't understand why it appears as optional on the settlement statement, and I'll definitely go there, I promise you. Um, but so yes, do you need title insurance? Yes. Here's the kicker to it, okay? If you are an investor out there and you're getting an, uh, an, an owner's policy as well as a loan policy and you're paying all closing costs, meaning that you've got to pay for both of those policies, right? You're using a hard money lender, hard money lender comes back and says, yes, we need, we need a loan policy because obviously the loan policy goes to the lender, the owner's policy goes to the owner, right? Get it? Um, if they say that, right, and you're an investor out there and you say, do I really need the owner's policy? You technically don't, okay? I have a certain whole, uh, investor of mine that I deal with all the time. We actually did a comparison where he purchased a couple of properties. On the first property, we did both policies. On the second policy, or I mean, on the second transaction, he was getting a hard money loan with a loan policy. We took it off, like the owner's policy we took off. We just issued him a loan policy. And then he resold both of those properties. And we compared the difference between how much he saved, right, as to how much he, he, how much he paid for for both of the policies on the first deal, how much he paid for for the loan policy on the second deal. And when he resold them, because on the loan policy file that he, we only issued him a loan policy, he wasn't able to get a reissue credit. So he wasn't able to reuse that owner's policy that he didn't have, right, to receive the actual reissue credit, which is if you sell the property within three years of the date of purchase. So we did a comparison and the savings was literally probably about 100 to $130 difference. Like, it's insane. So do you need title insurance? Yes, you do. If you're purchasing a property and you're getting an, a loan from a lender, a bank, Van Dyke Mortgage, um, any of them, sorry, Van Dyke's the first one that came to mind because I just lost a, a dear friend of mine uh, that used to work for Van Dyke, but um, say you're using a, a mortgage broker, whatever, the, the owner's policy is actually an optional item. But if your seller is paying for that owner's policy, pursuant to your terms of your contract, then you might as well get it, right? There's no reason to say, I don't need that, take that off because you're not paying for it at the end of the day as a buyer on a retail deal. From an investing standpoint, this is where you can save yourself a little bit of money when you actually purchase the property right then and there. 
But the difference is too, if we're not issuing both of the policies at the same time, the amount of the loan policy is actually equivalent and a little bit more than the actual owner's policy. So it's based off of the actual rate that is regulated through the state of Florida. Um, however, you know, it's a, it's a cost that you would save. We issue a, we charge a, a simultaneous issue policy um, for a loan when an owner's policy is being issued at 350. Um, that would save you the extra 350 in your pocket at the time of the closing. But when you went to go resell the property, you wouldn't have an owner's policy to provide and say you're doing it within that three year period, then you're only gonna, you, you, you have no savings there. So when your, your buyer, now that you're the seller, chooses title or doesn't choose title and you're stuck paying those closing costs again, you're now gonna have to pay that owner's policy. So it kind of works out both ways, right? By having your owner's policy, when you go to resell it, it's gonna give you a reissue credit. That can save you hundreds of dollars off on that owner's policy premium that you're now paying for that new buyer. Um, so do you need it? I think you do. Um, I always tell my investors though, straight up, I'm like, if you don't want an owner's policy and you've got a hard money lender that requires you to have a loan policy, you don't have to have it. Your protection is still there, although it falls to your lender. It doesn't fall to you. So that's the difference. And if there was a lien miss or something like that, that the lender wasn't made aware of, then it would just kind of go away. The owner's policy protects the owner. The loan policy protects the lender. So you as an owner get to make that decision, but if the seller is already paying for that item, you might as well just go ahead and let it happen, right? It's free, why not? Um, and then if you're gonna refinance um, from a, a retail transaction, you can reuse that owner's policy and you can reuse your survey as long as you haven't made any structural changes on your refi, and that saves you a ton of money. We actually have been saving people well over $1,000 when they're refinancing just because they have their previous survey that they haven't made any structural changes to and their owner's policy from when they purchased the property. And that three-year time frame does not matter, right, whenever you're doing a refi. So there's no, it's like a 10-year cap. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, next question, how much does title insurance cost, right? Well, uh, the state of Florida is regulated. Um, I have a link that I can send you, um, and I also have a um, breakdown as to how we calculate that. Um, our system automatically does it. A lot of title company systems, we just plug in the, the purchase price, and then it auto automatically spits out what our, our owner's policy is going to be. Um, but I do have the actual breakdown. So if anybody needs that breakdown, um, please feel free to email me. I will shoot that over to you in a heartbeat. If you need a fee sheet, I'll shoot that over to you as well. Um, so yeah, it, it's a one-time amount. You pay it at the time of the closing, the premium. You don't have to pay it monthly thereafter. It's not a yearly amount that you pay. As long as you hold title and ownership to that same property that you were given a policy for, you're good. Um, the minute that you do a quick claim deed, the minute that you do a quit claim deed, sorry, had to express that, um, that severs that policy. So a lot of people right now are doing quick claim deeds. Please, for the love of God, do not do your own quick claim deed. Call a title company, call an attorney, let them do it for you. Um, because there's a lot of things that we do whenever we do a quick claim deed to ensure that there's no severance of that title. Um, so yeah, it's very important got to get a title search done whenever you're doing a quick claim deed. That's my only suggestion, my biggest suggestion. Don't just go out there and do it. Um, title insurance paid annually. We hit that. Who pays for the title insurance policy? We went over that. It's definitely stated in your contract. So whoever picks title is the one that pays for the actual owner's policy. Remember that. The only county that that's a little bit different, um, actually a couple counties, Miami-Dade and Broward, um, whenever the seller actually pays for the, the transfer tax and the buyer pays for the owner's policy is the difference in Miami-Dade and Broward County. Sarasota County is a buyer pick, buyer pay county. Um, so the buyer gets to choose the title company, the buyer pays the owner's policy. Every other county in the state of Florida is a seller pick, seller pay. Um, just to clarify, unless it's otherwise stated in the contract. Um, another question was, what sort of claims does a title insurance policy cover against? Which is an excellent, excellent question. <laughs> 
All right, so I'm going to read this little blob, and then if you guys have anything to say about it, please please reach out. I'm, I'm trying to read as I go um, and answer questions as I go. And Daniel, don't, for, don't think I forgot about you because I didn't. Um, the party responsible to pay for the owner's – oh, wrong, wrong thing. Sorry. Title insurance protects the buyer and or – the lender from title defects or claims that others may have to the property. It also protects the buyer from any outstanding debts of previous owners. Those are prior mortgages, unpaid taxes, um, code violations that were recorded, judgments against the person individually, whatever. Um, what the policy covers should be clearly stated within the terms, but generally speaking, title insurance policies cover, cover any undiscovered defects or claims that appear once a thorough title search has been carried out, which we do a 30-year search. Every title company does back 30 years, plain as day. Um, this also might include forged signatures, unpaid real estate taxes, as well as other types of lien and encumbrances, which I said our main ones are usually open mortgages, judgments against that person individually. Um, and of course, you know, if you have a common name and you have a judgment pop up or 1500 judgments because your last name is Owens or something like that, Johnson, Parker, um, then we will do our necessary research. We will call you. We'll get your social security number, we'll get your date of birth, and we'll check all of those off. If those are not you, then you'll just sign a not one in the same name affidavit at closing. Um, easy breezy, beautiful. Um, how much could you lose if a claim is filed against your property? So if somebody goes against the title policy, how much could you possibly lose? Like what is it gonna cost you, right? <clears throat> Laws can depend on many factors. Even if it's a small claim or there are no grounds for it, it will cost time and legal fees. Always does, right? Uh, what the policy covers should be clear. Oh, sorry. <laughs> ah, I'm losing myself. In the most extreme of situations, you could lose the entire property and yet be legally responsible to pay the loan you took out to buy it. However, it's very rarely the case. So your title insurance will actually cover you against that. Um, if there's an actual claim placed against your, your property, um, your policy, if it was done prior to you purchasing it, then your policy will cover it. If it was done after you purchased it and it was nothing to do with in the interim of when you were buying the property, then it falls on you is, is generally the way that that situation works out. Just so you all know. Um, uh -huh. How does title insurance protect my investment in case of a claim? If the claim has grounds and a judge rules against the buyer, the, the insurance issuer, right, title company or the underwriter, it's usually the underwriter, will compensate the loss up to the amount stated on the policy. So if you had a claim, right, and we go to court, the whole nine yards, and the judge says, yes, the buyer is in the right, you know, you, you know, Tiago National Title have to pay the buyer X amount of dollars, we're going to pay you up to the amount of, of the actual policy. Um, and that's usually your coverage amount is based off of your purchase price. Um, if you have a lender, then your loan amount is the actual um, coverage amount for the actual loan policy, just so you know the difference between that. Um, are there any time types? Two different types of title insurance policies. Um, I already said that previously, but I'll touch base a little bit about that. Yes, there are two different types. There's only two. You have an owner's policy and you have a loan policy. When you refinance, loan policy. When you purchase, owner's policy. When you get a loan when you're purchasing, loan policy. Loan goes to the lender, owner's goes to the owner of record, the new owner of record, not the seller because the seller is actually stating for the terms of the contract that they're giving you free and clear title. So that's super important to know as well. Um, how long does your coverage last? So when you are issued an owner's policy, how long does that coverage take effect, right? Is it only for a year? Is it for 10 years? How do you know? Well, an owner, uh, the coverage will last as long as you own, maintain that property. So as long as you hold title to that property, right? So whether it's 20 years, whatever, that policy and that coverage lasts during that entire time frame of when you've owned it. 
That includes you renting it out from an investing standpoint. That includes it being Airbnb. It has nothing to do with what you do with the actual property, whether you're homesteaded, whether it's an investment property. That doesn't matter about your owner's policy. Your coverage of your policy will last for as long as you retain um, ownership of that actual property. The minute that you sell it, that policy becomes null and void. Um, okay. Let's, this is a question and it's a common question that people Google on um, what is a title search because I keep saying like you got to get a title search done. What is an actual title search? Do you, does anybody know what a title search actually is? <laughs> I do, um, of course. Um, but a title search is actually equivalent to a background check. So it's basically like a background check for the property. We search back 30 years, right? Um, our underwriter and our title examiners will go through literally every single deed, every single mortgage, every single assignment, every single release for the last 30 years that has been recorded on that property. And then they put it in like a timeline grid, right? So we go back to the most recent deed to find out who is our owner of record, right? Because a lot of people are putting owner of record on the contract as the seller without looking in the property at appraiser to see who the actual owner of record is. Um, but we'll go back to that recent, the most recent deed, last recorded deed. Um, that's our owner of record. Um, and then we go back a couple of, of deeds just to make sure that the legal description has remained the same so that there's no break in that. Um, and then we will search their name uh, to pull an actual judgment search. So that's very important because judgments um, on a property could be damaging. It could make or break a deal depending on how much they are. IRS liens, I've seen them kill deals. IRS liens are are a, a nightmare. They can be an absolute nightmare. Um, I had a file that it took our seller almost eight months to negotiate with the IRS to get his amount reduced and they still didn't reduce it and he wound up having to pay the whole thing anyways. So it's very important to make sure uh, when we do our searches that we make sure that we're searching for every little possible item that can pull up on title and then what is once that's all been searched and verified, they will put it on what's called a title commitment. So the title commitment comes back to us. We then provide the title commitment out to everybody and we list out the things that we need to do in order to clear that. The most common items that you're going to see on your title commitments are satisfaction of mortgages, which just means there's a mortgage. Sometimes you'll see two of them. Um, biggest thing to pay attention to when you're looking at a, a title commitment um, is to see who that mortgage is held by because sometimes there's a previous, it was the previous sellers um, from the person that you're, you know, actually representing or dealing with that's selling the property. Um, and in that case, there's a little bit of an extra step that we have to do just to ensure that um, that mortgage was actually paid off. And this documentation that we have to provide over to our underwriter to be able to close over that item um, if a release was not. Uh, recorded from the actual lending company and generally it's the lending company's responsibility unless it's a private financing or a hard money lender. Um, there are most common thing also you're gonna see a lot of premiums to be paid at closing don't pay attention to that usually items one to four are not that big of a deal um, and also other common things if you're under an LLC as a seller we are going to have to verify that your LLC is active and then if it's not active there's special verbiage that has to be written on the deed um, that you're dissolving your LLC um, and getting rid of all of your um, properties etc within that LLC uh, super important for that um, so yeah that's what a title search is something that is our lifeline and if we don't do it <laughs> We have no title commitment and we have absolutely no way to ensure that the transaction that we're doing to you is insurable. Um, yeah. Already went over that, already went over that, already went over that, cool. Um, a lot of people ask us too, uh, what is an escrow account? So whenever you go into contract um, from, a buy from a buying standpoint, um, there's usually an amount that you and the seller or your agents, the buyer's agent and the listing agent have agreed upon as far as what the escrow deposit should be, right? So what we do is we hold that money in an escrow account. So we hold it within our, our file, um, in our, our non-interest bearing account, excuse me. Um, hi Mike. Um, and 
And we cannot release that money until we have a fully executed release and cancellation. So let's say that we get all the way to closing. Um, we just had one yesterday or a couple days ago um, and the buyer backs out. Buyer wires their money, they sign their docs and then they say, I just saw this property and I don't wanna buy it anymore, right? Basically, technically the seller is responsible or is able to obtain that actual escrow deposit, right? Because the buyer backed out, they're out of their inspection period, and now they just wasted the seller's time, okay? If we do not receive a fully signed, fully signed buyer and seller have to sign the form, um, if the buyer and seller don't sign a release and cancellation, that money will stay with the title company until we've received that. Especially in a dispute situation, if the seller feels that they're entitled to the money, the listing agent is saying the, the seller gets the funds and the buyer's like, I'm not giving you my money, it will sit in our non-interest bearing escrow account until you guys agree upon it. And if there's a mediation a situation that has to be done, we can assist with that. We can direct you to where you need to go for that. Um, but we definitely don't technically get involved in that situation. Sometimes our owner will give them a call just to kind of see if they're going to be willing to sign it after speaking to an attorney. Um, but, you know, escrow account, super, super important. A lot of people call us and get frustrated um, because we haven't received a fully signed release and, and cancellation and we still have to hold on to those funds. If we are, if we release those funds without a fully signed release and cancellation, we are at risk for that money. So if somebody comes back and says, hey, I was supposed to get that, and they get an attorney and they sue us, we are now entitled and responsible to provide those funds that we released without a fully signed release and cancellation. So it's very, very important that agents out there understand it is your responsibility it's not our responsibility. There's agents involved. It is your responsibility to get a fully signed release and cancellation. That way we can release the funds according to how the document advises us to do so. Um, so that's very important. Escrow agreements. Does anybody know what an escrow agreement is? Hmm. So let's say that I am getting a hard money loan and I need a construction loan, right? So I'm gonna get a construction loan. Um, I'm gonna put $40,000 in a construction draw that the title company is going to hold, right? Um, and I need it pulled every, you know, I'm gonna need $10,000, let's say $10,000 for the next four months until the money's gone uh, for my contractor. What the title company is required to do whenever there's funds being held in an escrow account, right, after the time of the closing, is there has to be an, an escrow agreement um, drawn up. Um, the title company signs it, the buyer signs it, and the seller signs it. And within that actual document, it's detailed out as to how those funds are gonna be moved, how those funds can be requested, how they can be dispersed, when they get dispersed, Etc. Etc. If there's a charge for it, etc. Etc. This also goes for any funds whatsoever that the title company is required to hold back after the closing. Um, say the seller is still living in the property, and the buyer and the seller agree that okay, I'm gonna have the seller withhold five thousand dollars from closing title. I want you guys to hold that money in escrow, and then within a month, once he moves out, he can have his five grand back just in case there's damages an escrow agreement will be done, always. Any, 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 any time that you do any outside um, or situations that are gonna happen after the closing, the title company has to have an escrow agreement signed by all parties. It's super important because that, basically on that document, it's going to detail out everything, every possible situation that could happen and how you go about getting your money out of it. In a situation where the seller is still living in the property and there's $5,000 being held back until they move out, the buyer has to approve it, the seller has to approve it to the title company, and then we're able to release those funds. We cannot release funds out of an escrow holdback situation until all parties have confirmed that the property is in good standing. Obviously, the seller will say, hey, I've moved out. The buyer will then go do their inspection to ensure that the seller didn't do any damage while they were in that property for that period of time. The buyer will then respond to the title company and say, go ahead and release the funds to the seller. Everything's good. Now, in the event that there's an issue, let's say the seller got mad and took all of the utility or all of the, um, the fridge, all the stove, everything out of the property, then 
there's a dispute. Now there's a dispute because the seller's going to say, hey, I moved out. The buyer's going to do their walkthrough and say, wait a minute, where's all these things that were, were part of the terms of the contract when we went under contract? Where did they all go? You know what I mean? Now there's a dispute. That money will stay until the dispute is taken care of. Um, so they have to come to an agreement. If there's a new document that needs to be drawn up and executed, we can take care of that as well too. But everything has to be in writing. Everything has to be in writing. Um, what does the escrow agent do? So that's a really great question. <laughs> um, an escrow agent is either a person or an entity. Generally, an escrow agent, what we consider ourselves are closers or processors, a manager, um, a front desk rep or receptionist, a uh, junior processor. Um, in some states, they're considered escrow agents, and sometimes um, that just means that we're responsible, we're the ones that are handling the money um, in the transaction. So title companies handle all the money. We want the escrow deposit, we want the closing proceeds sent to us, we want um, the lending funds sent to us, that way we control the money, we cut all the checks and we disperse all the funds once we're said and done. So really good to know that. Um, but that's what we do. An escrow agent is just an additional term for what we do within. Um, and if it's an entity, then it's actually the title company or attorney if you choose to use one. Um, a lot of people have asked us, what are you supposed to bring to closing? Um, it's very simple. Uh, <laughs> if you're a seller, you always, seller or buyer, you always have to have a form of photo ID, right? From a selling standpoint, if you're selling a property, we don't need two forms of ID unless we've specifically told you, hey, make sure to bring a passport, bring your, your you know, driver's license. But if you're a seller, you only need to have one form of identification. If you're a buyer, the lender, if you're borrowing money, sometimes the lender will require you to have two forms of identification of which the title company will let you know prior to you signing your documents. Hey, make sure to bring two forms of ID. Um, but generally, you only need one. You only need a photo ID. We've got to make sure that you are who you say you are when you're coming in and signing your documents. Um, and then also, the one of the best things I always like people to bring to closing as a witness, <laughs> right? So if you, you don't have to come into our office with a witness. This only pertains to people out there, especially nowadays that are getting mobile notaries sent to them. Make sure that your neighbor, um, grab your neighbor. You're going to need a witness, whether you're a seller or a buyer. If you're a seller, the deed has to have two witnesses. If you're a buyer and you've got a mortgage coming in, you're doing a mortgage, getting a loan, you're going to need two witnesses on that mortgage. The notary can always act as one of those witnesses, but um, definitely make sure, and it can't be you know, a family member with the same last name and all that kind of stuff. It's gotta be somebody that's not related to you whatsoever. So just know that. And make sure to bring a strong signing hand because you're definitely going to be signing a lot of documents if you're a buyer with a loan. Um, sellers, not so much. You've only got about 20 to 25 pages of docs that you might have to sign. Um, sometimes there's additional docs that the lenders require us to have you sign if you're doing, if your buyer is doing an FHA loan, there's usually an FHA addendum. If there's a VA loan, then there's usually a VA addendum that has to be signed by all parties. Um, usually the listing agent has to sign it, the buyer's agent has to sign it, the title closer has to sign it, um, and both the buyer and seller have to sign and date it. And then it's got the date of the actual contract written into it. So great to know as well. Um, how long does the closing process take? So for us, <laughs> from a title standpoint, I will say this, title companies are generally ready before anybody else is, right? So unless you're a cash buyer um, and you were ready to close the second that you signed that contract, right? And the seller was ready to close the second that they signed that contract because let's face it, when you sign a contract, you were probably literally ready that second and that day. Um, but in order for us to be able to ensure the transaction, provide a clear policy, um, and do our process, we generally need about five to seven business days. Right now, we're kind of extending that to about 10 business days just to be on the safe side so that we get our information back from the lien search companies. Um, and if you've got an association, you better give yourself at least 20 to 30 days to close. Right now, HOAs and management companies are not necessarily open um, and they are causing a couple of delays, but we do have a way around that if we need to. 
um, not necessarily a way around it, but it's just an, an, an addendum that gets signed um, or an affidavit that gets signed at closing, just notating it. And then once that estoppel comes back in, then we're able to close that item out. So that would be a great uh, negotiation standpoint with the buyer and the seller to say, hey seller, why don't you hold back $2,000 in escrow if you're up to date on your HOA dues and when that estoppel comes back in, we'll close and then we'll do an escrow agreement for you. We just went over that. Um, but yeah, generally, if you've got a loan, lenders typically are, are and I'm just gonna throw this number out there because this is a generic question, but lenders generally need 30 to 45 days. There are some bomb.com lenders out there that will get you pre-approved the whole nine yards, get you fully underwritten and approved within five days, seven days, 10 days. I don't know if that time frame has changed. Um, I will be bringing on a lender to do a kind of like a, a question and answer thing with a lender just to kind of give you that information um, probably next week. Um, I just have to pick through one of my millions of lenders that I love so much. So, um, but generally it is, if you're getting a loan, you're going to need about 30 to 45 days because there's a huge process that has to get done. You have to get approved. You have to go through underwriting a couple of times. You've got to get an appraisal done, um, an inspection done. So you go through your inspection period and that's generally five to seven days. Um, and then from a, a cash deal standpoint, I've closed cash deals within three to four days. Is that time frame still accurate right now? It's possible. Um, it's definitely possible. There might be some delays with some of the searches, and then in that case, you know, we'll let you know. And if you guys want to sign a hold harmless, great. Um, until that information comes back, you know, not a problem. If there's money that wants to be put in escrow just as a hold until that that information comes back in, it's totally fine. Um, but our title searches right now, which is the core of what we do and the commitment and the issuance of that policy, are generally coming back within about 48 to 72 hours right now. Um, so as long as title's clear and we just have to order a mortgage payoff or something like that, and the lien search situation isn't so important for you, and you could do a hold harmless, we can close you within you know, the four days. Um, but definitely try to give us, if you want your full lien search done, make sure that you give us at least seven to 10 business days. Business days, not, not including Saturday and Sunday, even though I work every damn day anyways. <laughs> um, what should you expect at the actual closing? So that, I always say that, um, whenever I get asked that question, especially from a seller, a seller or even a buyer, right? Like you're at the finish line. You've literally gone through all the headaches that you possibly can. You've dealt with all the crap. You've dealt with the inspection coming back and now there's repairs that are needed and you fix those repairs. You are a buyer and you, you dealt with your lender and got them every bit of personal information that you possibly could know to mankind um, in a timely manner. You've been fully underwritten and now you've got your clear to close, right? Once the title company starts reaching out to you for closing and scheduling timeframes and asking you, hey, when do you want to sign, da, 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 we're there. We are at that point. As long as everything keeps moving and the buyer doesn't lose their job if they're getting a loan, then we're golden. We're at that finish line. So what should you expect at the closing? Expect happiness. Expect um, excitement from us because we're just as excited uh, for you as you are to buy a house um, and we're just as excited for you to sell that home if that's something that you really wanted to do um, but for me I would just say bring attitude bring happiness bring excitement celebrate it right because that's what we're there to do at that point we've been through so much in dealing with the back end of everything keeping everybody on track, keeping them updated with information, letting them know when there's issues happening, if there's going to be delays, whatever it is, that you've literally gotten to that point. So it's literally a celebration for you. Um, and, you know, it's, it's pretty simple. At the actual closing, what you can actually expect to happen once you've came in and signed your documents, a lot of people think, hey, I just signed my docs, I wired you my money, I, I should be good to go. Sometimes it doesn't work that way, um, and there could be reasons. Um, a lot of the times we have to get a funding number from the lender, so we have to send them back all the documents that you signed or a certain part of the documents or a certain number of documents, and we cannot technically release funds until they've issued that funding number to us. That goes for hard money lenders as well. A lot of hard money lenders out there that are able to loan right now 
that were able to loan prior to all this COVID-19, um, they require the same thing. They like to see that the documents were signed accurately. They like to see that we notarized properly, that you dated where you were supposed to date, that you initialed where you were supposed to initial. Um, so once the lender has reviewed all of those documents, we've received the seller docs and the buyer docs, the buyer funds and the lender funds, and we've gotten that funding approval, then we're ready to go. Um, what we will do at that point is then you know, give our customers a call that are receiving wires. We verify that information verbally with them. We then submit that request over to our wire department. The wire department will then go through their verification process to make sure that the information they're entering into our banking system is accurate. Then that gets double checked. Once that's been double checked, the wires go out, right? Um, we send all the signed documents back to the buyer and the seller if they prefer to have you know, um, emailed copies. If they want physical paper copies, we can mail them, we can give them to them at the time of the closing, etc., etc. Um, once all of that's been done, then we submit our file to our post-closing department. Our post-closing department will then go ahead and record the documents that are required to be recorded, and in most cases it's a deed and then the mortgage. Um, once that's been done, once the documents come back from um, Simplifile, which is an electronic recording system, um, <clears throat> once those documents come back, then the file then goes to the uh, policy department. The policy department will then issue that actual policy. They issue the owner's policy to the owner, they issue the loan policy to the lender, and then they send out to the buyer the original deed with their policy and to the lender would be their the loan policy with the original recorded mortgage. And then we send that out. Um, once that's been completed and the policy has been issued, everybody has been paid, our file is then null and void, or it's closed. It's technically fully fully closed and funded at that point. So um, from, my, from our standpoint in the closing part of what we do um, from the processor to the closer, um, it is done once we've actually dispersed funds. Um, and we've submitted our file over to post-closing. And from a company standpoint, from a title standpoint, uh, from the company or from an attorney standpoint, it's not fully done until the policies have been issued. And that's the difference there. Um, let's see. No, 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 no. Um, how much money are you gonna need for escrow at closing? So that's generally uh, the bottom line amounts. If you ever need a net sheet, I've got an online net sheet that's awesome. Um, I've done probably about 40 net sheets in the last three days alone, um, including Sunday, so the last four days. Um, but we have an online net sheet system that'll give you an idea. Whenever you as an agent are going on to that system, or even if you're a lender, put as much information on there as you know at that time. So whenever somebody asks me to do a net sheet so they know how much they're going to need at closing or how much they're going to receive from the actual closing based off the offer they've been given, um, I always ask a lot of questions. And the reason I ask as many questions as I do is not to cause you frustration, but it's to make sure that I'm actually giving an accurate net sheet. Sometimes these net sheets, if you just tell us, Here's a property address. I need it for 123 Main Street. The offer's at 200,000. That's great. What's your commission? Because that's going to that's going to affect the seller's bottom line. Do they have a do they have a current mortgage? Do they know what that principal balance is at right now? We might pad it by $3,000 or a couple thousand dollars just to be on the safe side. Is there an association, right? Is there are they monthly dues? Are they quarterly? Are, have, has the seller been up to date on their dues? All this kind of stuff matters for us whenever we're doing a net sheet because it's gonna give you the most accurate net sheet. If you just shoot out an address and a sale price and maybe a commission and we do a net sheet for you and we go to closing and the seller receives that and they're like, wait a minute, what are all these extra charges that we weren't advised of? Well, we didn't know. So whenever we did that net sheet, you've gotta give us as much information as you possibly can. Um, that way, we, when we're doing that estimated cost, we can get it as to the T as possible. Uh, biggest suggestion for anybody. I'm going to go back to Daniel's question because it's a fabulous question that I really want to touch base on. Um, and he's absolutely right. Whenever we send out um, closing statements, we constantly get asked, um, why is the owner's policy listed as optional on the closing statement? And the reason for that is, Ready for this? It is an optional item. Whenever there's a simultaneous issued policy being done, um, you don't have to have an owner's policy. 
You don't. Your lender is the one that's holding first lien position on that property, okay? Um, if you're getting a loan, that's what the lender is going to require. That's why they want a loan policy, is that that's their insurance that they are in first lien position, okay? Um, so if you have a lender and they and you're paying, say you're an investor and you're paying all closing costs and you have to pay the owner's policy, now your hard money lender is like, hey, you need to get a loan policy too. You want to save yourself some 350 bucks, you can totally do that. I have an investor, like I said, you know, earlier in my, in my live that does that all the time and we wait out the options. Um, so do you have to? No. But like I said before, it's optional, yes. But if the seller is paying it for you, why would you not want it? It's free. So that's my, that's my little two cents on that, Daniel, for there, dear. <laughs> um, I always like to remove the optional verbiage in there, especially if the seller is paying for it. Um, because usually what happens too, whenever we do a closing disclosure, which is what we're kind of all on now, whenever we're dealing with um, a retail lender, a closing disclosure will actually have on there that it's an optional item. What our system does is it basically charges both the owner's policy and the loan policy all on the buyer side, right? And then if you go to page three of the closing disclosure, there's gonna be what's called a title owner's policy premium adjustment or a title owner's adjustment that's done on that. And what that does is that basically is a credit to the buyer and it's a debit to the seller for the amount of the full loan owner's policy. So if the seller is paying that owner's policy amount, it's gonna all populate on the buyer side. And then on page three, there's gonna be a credit that goes back to the buyer or back to the buyer from the seller. And that's just for the amount of the owner's policy premium. So if you look at the two numbers, the owner's policy premium that's collected um, under the uh, page two of the closing disclosure, which is in section H, it's usually in section H of the of this of the CD, or sometimes it's in section C. Um, but if you look at that number, the owner's policy, it looks really, really, really small, right? It's like forty dollars, a hundred and something dollars. And then if you look at your loan policy, your loan policy is like thousand dollars or in some odd change. So let's say that the owner's policy is a thousand dollars. The loan policy is three hundred and fifty dollars. Right, which is a total of thirteen fifty for both of the policy premiums. Sorry, I'm doing my math. Um, what you'll see on that closing disclosure on the buyer's column is you won't see thirteen fifty. You won't see one thousand for the owner's policy and then three fifty for the loan policy. Okay, lenders out there, this is super important for you guys watching. Um, what you will see is probably um, fifty dollars for the owner's policy, and then under the loan policy, you'll see. $1,300, right? And then on page three of the CD, you're gonna see a credit to the buyer because it's gonna be on um, section K. Yeah. <laughs> You'll see a credit to the buyer for $1,000. And all that does is that says, okay, the seller's paying it, our system acknowledges that, but we disclose all the amounts on the buyer side and then we credit back on page three and that's just the way that works. And that's why, Daniel, on the closing statement, it shows optional. So if you see that and you're a buyer out there or an agent out there and you see that it says optional, if in your contract that your buyer has signed, that you drew up, right, and that the buyer and seller have both signed and the seller is the one paying the policy premium, leave it alone because it's free for the buyer. The buyer is only paying the 350 policy to the lender or the 250 or whatever the title company charges. So that was a really great question. Any other questions? Does anybody have any questions? And I went over a lot of my questions that I Googled, but um, anybody out there that's got them, I'll sit tight for a second, let you all kind of figure it out. Um, foreclosure questions, tax deed sale. Um, we do a lot of that. Sorry, one second. Um, we do a lot of tax deed sales. We've got this awesome company that will issue a certificate of title. Yeah, um, I just got one now, so um, always fun. Uh, but we do have a company that will do a certificate of title basically, and it basically wipes out the quiet title action suit. And that's required whenever you do a tax deed sale purchase. Um, and a lot of you watching out there 
that don't know what a tax deed property is. So in the state of Florida, um, if somebody does not pay their property taxes in the state of Florida for their property, um, there's a bidding that's able to be done. So somebody can come in and pay that property tax for you, right? Um, and then what's, is, what's, what's done is there's a, a tax certificate that gets issued to the person that paid those taxes on behalf of that property that's not the owner um, or the lending company. If that happens three years, for three years you didn't pay your property taxes and somebody else pays your property taxes for those full three years, that person can now take your property from you just because you didn't pay your property tax. So then what happens is the county says, okay, it's going to auction. We're gonna go ahead and auction in tax deed. So there's a website that a lot of investors might know about, might not know about, but there's a website in every single county's record um, that's for tax deeds. Um, and there are all the properties that are um, able and up for tax deed sale. Um, you get them at a super, super, super cheap rate, right? Um, and all that has to happen is you call us <laughs> and we will get you in contact with our uh, tax deed company. Um, they will do a search of the property um, and then possibly issue you a certificate of title, which basically is like a certificate of title that's out of foreclosure. So it wipes the need for the quiet title action suit. However, code violations that are recorded um, on these properties all attach. Um, mortgages don't. I, if you need more information about that, I will let you know. Sorry, one of my people was calling me. But if you need more information about that, let me know and I will get you in contact with somebody that can explain it to the T because he's phenomenal. Thank you, Lenny, out there. Love you, Lenny. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a whole nother uh, property list that is going to become quite big once people start picking up on it. Um, so it's another way for investors to kind of build their um, their properties up um, and their portfolios up, especially if people are turning and doing some work and then trying to resell or renting them out. So tax deeds are awesome. Uh, we are one of the only companies, I think, well, period, that can actually do them. We do them efficiently. Um, it's a little bit can get a little bit time consuming, but it's a lot cheaper to do it this way than going through a quiet title action suit because that could cost you, you know, $5,000, $6,000 and take you anywhere from six to eight months to be done. This alternative is a fraction of the cost and is time is cut severely in half, if not three fourths. So um, really good information to know. Um, let's see, let's see. Let's see. Nope, don't need that. But yeah, so anybody out there got any questions, you can ask. If not, you've got my email. I say it all the time, every day. Um, amber at tiagotitle.com. If you've got questions, you can call me, you can text me, call my office. My staff is fantastic in both of my branches in St. Pete and Seminole. Um, they're able to answer a lot of questions and if they can't, they will get me on the phone. They'll have an answer within five, 10 minutes and they'll be able to, to give you a response um, immediately. Um, but yeah, that's title questions in a nutshell. It kind of goes over about, I think I went over about 25 questions that are the most common questions that people are Google searching when they're looking for houses. Um, and it's good information to have. Um, and yeah, if you are an investor out there or a buyer's agent out there dealing with investors and you don't know how to negotiate those types of situations, holler at me because I can help you with that and give you a ton of different ideas of how you can sell it back to the seller. So yeah, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you for tuning in on this fabulous Wednesday, which is actually Administrative Professionals Day. Um, so for those of you that have an admin that you work with, today is Administrative Professionals Day. Um, make sure to say thank you for everything that they do for you. I am going to go say thank you to mine um, and have a great day. Keep staying safe out there and for anybody that needs any assistance, I am always available. You can reach me on my cell phone. A lot of you already have my cell. If you don't, send me a message and I will send it to you. Um, you can reach me at the office, number 
5085. I am 99% of the time I'm in St. Pete all the time now. Um, I do go over to my uh, Seminole Largo office, but that team over there pretty much has it down and Tiffany holds down the fort over there for me there. Um, but if you need that office number, Tiffany is awesome. She's available to, to answer questions as well. Um, super, super knowledgeable, um, especially in investor deals and all that kind of stuff too. Her number is 727-205-1641. Email mine, amber at tiagotitle.com. So have a great Wednesday. Happy hump day. And I will be back on hopefully the rest at some point this week. Um, I might do a little Facebook Live this weekend so everybody can kind of see my awesome garden that I was talking about on my last Facebook Live because my boyfriend's awesome and built me a garden. Um, and then next week, um, I am working on bringing on Beth Anderson and I to kind of do a dual question and answer thing. And then I will also bring a lender in to go over that situation as well. So have a wonderful day. Happy hump day. Enjoy your administrative professionals day for all of those admins out there that do fantastic work for all of us. And bye.